From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 19, recorded on October 3rd, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. Today, I'd like to take a closer look at Paul's most recent column, Should Scientists Openly Debate Vaccine Policies? And Paul, you begin this column by writing, scientists constantly question the validity of scientific studies among themselves. Uh, yeah, I and mean, you and I know this. This is what happens. But I, I think often the public doesn't understand that that's part of science. They think we're waffling. <laughs> it's how we get better. I mean, as a young scientist, when I would appear in, in either national or international meetings and present my data, those data were criticized. I mean, was I really able to draw the conclusions I drew based on the data that I showed? Did I do the right controls? Right. Was my was it internally consistent, robust, reproducible? And that's how you got better. So that's the cauldron in which you and I both were raised. And so the point of this column is that that kind of questioning doesn't do well in the public health arena. And and you give as an example uh, the bivalent booster story. So why don't you tell us that? Right. It's it's a tough lesson. I think last year was a tough lesson and this year has been a tough lesson. So, so um, I'm on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. In June of 2022, we sat down to discuss what we were going to do about COVID vaccines. Now, up to that point, the only vaccine that we had used was the original strain, the ancestral strain, the Wuhan 1 strain. But starting late 2021, early 2022, the Omicron strain came into the United States and it was immunivasive. Um, so what to do? And so the decision that was made, and it really wasn't our decision, it was a decision really made by the FDA and the in concert with the pharmaceutical companies, was to, instead of just using the Wuhan strain, why don't we do a half a dose of the Wuhan 1 strain and a half of a dose of what was one of the circulating Omicron strains? Now, the original data that were generated were with the original Omicron strain, BA1, but by the time we sat down, BA1 was gone. To only to be replaced by BA4, BA5. So that was the decision. Let's move forward with this. Now, the data that were shown us at that time were not terribly convincing. It, it didn't look like that when you get, when you added that BA1 strain, which were the data we were presented with, that you really got a neutralizing antibody response against BA1 much greater than you would have gotten with Wuhan 1 alone, because that was the goal. By adding that Omicron strain, you would then increase the amount of neutralizing antibodies. The data weren't terribly convincing. Um, nonetheless, we we moved forward with that. And you know, it's it's you know, I think in fairness, in fairness to the FDA, in fairness to pharmaceutical companies, they thought this would be kind of the next step on the way to making better vaccines. Fair enough. But the good news is you can tell whether or not that was the right move. So what happened over the next few months is studies that were done by David Ho in Columbia or Dan Baruch in um at Harvard, um, looked at, at people who were inoculated either with the the um, this bivalent vaccine, this two-in-one vaccine, or just the monovalent vaccine. Did they make a better neutralizing antibody response against BA4, BA5? And the answer was no. Um, and then there have been three studies, clinical studies, two with BA1, a third with uh, BA4, BA5, all bivalent vaccines, all prospective, all controlled, using a monovalent vaccine as the uh, as the other vaccine, and there was no difference. That's okay. It's it's okay not to be right exactly. Now, now boosters boosted. It just wasn't any better. I think what was hard for me was watching um, many in the public health arena saying it was better, saying it was much better. Mm -hmm. This is going to be much better, definitely better. So you should get it for that reason. And um, and so I took a contrary point of view. I did what scientists normally do, which is I submitted a perspective piece to the New England Journal of Medicine, which was published, which is to say, in order to get it published, it has to be reviewed. So I wasn't the only one that had this point of view. Obviously, people that read that also had that point of view. But when I got up, and I think the, the sort of the moment for me, the crystallizing moment was I was because I was on CNN a fair amount because I was on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. Um, I was asked by Pamela Brown this question. And first, she showed a, a, um, a clip of, um, of a public health official who was uh, the coronavirus uh, response coordinator at the White House saying this is a much better vaccine um, and that's why you need to get it. And so they, they then shifted to me and said, is he wrong? 
Pamela Brown said, is he wrong? And so you don't want to make it personal. So I said, well, here are two papers that were just published in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed it doesn't appear to be any better, no worse, but not better. And I was hammered for that, hammered. I mean, I got, there were two very prominent uh, bloggers, one a cardiologist, another one an epidemiologist, who basically said that, that what I had done is I had had frightened the American public about this vaccine, um, that, that because of me, the uptake was low last year, only one in five Americans who were uh, asked to get that vaccine, which is everybody over six months of age, actually got it. And that was in part my fault. I mean, I got, um, you know, I got, I was in places like the Daily Mail, Epic Times. I mean, that's when you know you're, mm. you're losing. And, you know, they, they basically said that I said that this vaccine wasn't any good, which is, isn't what I said. So I think the minute you weigh in on this, you're, by definition, whenever you weigh in on the media anyway, you could be misinterpreted. But here, because we so, we're so divisive, you're either on one side or another, when it, I appeared to be not clearly uh, stating what the public health group was, groups were stating, that I had gone to the other side. I mean, I got love letters from from anti-vaccine activists saying that things like they had been praying for me for years and now it's good to see that I have finally come over to their side. I mean, I was asked to be on Newsmax. When that happens, by the way, you know that your message isn't getting out there. And that was that was last year's lesson. So so what's the answer? Do, do you say nothing? Because when you say something, you're going to be misinterpreted. When you say something, you are going to be um, in, no, in, in many ways um, uh, invigorating anti-vaccine activists. And when you say something, um, because it's so device, divided, you're going to be seen as, as just confusing the American public because now it looks like we don't know what we're doing, right? This person says this, the other person says that. But I don't know. My, my feeling on this is just tell the truth as you see it. And because there are people who are going to appreciate that. And I, I think that's the way to do it. But I could be wrong. <laughs> what do you think? Well, well, what do you think the public health officials should have done? Should Instead of saying this vaccine is better, should they have sa said, for example, we think it's better. Uh, let's try it. What, what do you think they should have done? Yes, th th this is what we're doing. It's it's just tell the whole story. We Omicron is coming to the United States. Omicron is more immune evasive. We need to start getting away from Wuhan one, but we don't want to get away from it immediately, which is what their thinking was. Mm -hmm. So let's try this this measure and see whether or not this is is better. And then as data starts to roll out, they can say, well, I think we've learned a lesson here, a lesson that we will apply to future vaccines, which is what happened. I mean, the following year, I, this year, we don't. We no longer tether our vaccine to the Wuhan one strain. So it, it, you learn as you go, such is the nature of science. Our eyes are open. We're going to keep monitoring data. The good news is this boosters do boost. This does boost. It looks like it boosts to the same degree that the, the original strain did. Certainly no worse. It's important to get this vaccine in these groups for these reasons. We're, and we'll, we'll keep you posted. As we continue to learn, as we continue to have our eyes open, uh, we will keep you posted in the most straightforward, honest way we can, knowing that there is a group of people in this country who will just skewer you for, for doing that. So historically, you, you, you know the history of uh, public health and, and vaccination. Uh, has this always been like this? Or were, so were we always, were this, always this divide between the science and the public health statement? Or was it better at one point? It was much, much better at one point. And I, I, here's the example I would use. Mm -hmm. In 1955, um, five companies stepped forward to make Jonas Salk's polio vaccine. One of them made it particularly badly. So what Jonas Salk did, took polio, grew it up in cell culture, purified it, killed it with the inactivating agent formaldehyde. Um, one company made it badly. They failed to inactivate the virus. As, as a consequence, 120,000 children first and second graders in this country were inoculated with live, fully virulent polio virus, thinking it mm -hmm. was the polio vaccine. 40,000 developed abortive polio, meaning short-lived temporary paralysis. 168 people, mostly children, were permanently paralyzed and 10 were killed. I think it was the worst biological disaster in this country's history. Now that went to court. And, and the first trial was a trial of a little girl, actually who's still alive, although suffering, named Ann Gottstanker. Gottstanker v. Cutter Laboratories. And what they did was the, they presented all the data. And what you saw was, you saw that it wasn't only Cutter that had a problem. Wyeth also had a problem in activating the virus and also made a vaccine that at least with one lot 
paralyzed and killed. And then the other three companies all had trouble in activating the virus. It was a filtration problem. It was a mass production problem. And I think that that the, the jurors understood that. The jurors wanted to find Cutter not liable. They wanted to find them not guilty because they saw it for what it was. They saw it as a process of evolution. If it was a directed verdict, basically the judge said, if you find that this vaccine did cause paralysis, you have to find them uh, guilty. But if you listen to the, the voices in those exit interviews, those people, they trusted the government, they trusted the pharmaceutical companies, they trusted the public health agencies to get it right. And, and then they saw it for what it was, which was a process of evolution. And then the polio program was suspended for a couple of months. It went back online and people trusted that. That would never happen today. It's a much more divided time. And I think what makes it so hard today are, are two things. I think one is social media, which is um, just uh, a great place for <laughs> awful and good information. And I think also just the, the, the political environment of uh, conspiracy theory has sort of risen to the mainstream. More recently, you have been critical of the... the um the CDC recommendation uh, that everyone over, what, six months of age get this new fall uh, COVID vaccine, right? The XBB.1.5. And the same thing has happened. You've been criticized for being critical, right? <laughs> right. And, um, you know, what's interesting is that, see, this is another, to me, a, a, um, a lost opportunity. Because many other countries, the United, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Australia, three Scandinavian countries, uh, the World Health Organization have taken a different tact. And that tact has been, let's target high-risk groups. So, so it wasn't my idea. I mean, I thought, so the question is, what's the best way to convince those at greatest risk of serious disease to get the vaccine? And my attitude is tell people, OK, here's who's getting hospitalized. Here's who's dying. Here's why we need to vaccinate um, these groups. And that's the best way to get those groups vaccinated. But I think the, the public health officials here anyway think that the best way to do it is to say everybody should get it. Um, and I don't know who's right. I mean, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm right. Or maybe the, all these other countries that are doing it that way are right. But again, hammered. That was when I was actually asked to be on Newsmax. I don't know if you've ever watched Newsmax. No. It's like a <laughs> Saturday Night Live spoof of conservative television. I mean, it's just, it's outlandishly to one side. And I think I really disappointed them when I went on there because they thought I wasn't who they had imagined me to be. I mean, somehow I got moved into the category of a, a naysaying doctor when I, I don't think I'm that at all. I think I'm just trying to figure out what the best way is to do this. But again, if, if, if the reason that we're doing this, that we're saying everybody should get it, is because we are worried that, that by not doing that, that there are going to be certain groups who aren't going to get covered by private insurance, like someone who lives in the home of someone who, who's at that high risk or, or someone who works in a nursing home, then say that. Just say it. Be honest with, with the American public, knowing that there's going to be people who will, uh, who will uh, not understand what you're saying, who will be confused by what you're saying. But I think there are many people out there who will appreciate that honesty. I, I do think that. But again, I'm, you know, I'm an Eagle season ticket holder, so I'm a ridiculously optimistic person. So maybe I'm not the person that's determined this. I mean, do you think when, when you question the science, uh, do you think you're really encouraging anti-vaxxers, which is one of the things you've been accused of? I think it does seem to play out that way. I, I mean, only in that what you've done is you have not completely agreed with everything that's being said by public health agencies. And so, the, see, to them, they see that fissure. They see that crack. And they say, aha, see, the, 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 these public health agencies don't know what they're talking about. And here's someone who's saying that. I mean, I got a letter from uh, a pretty virulent anti-vaccine activist who said that she's been praying for me for years, me and my family for years, and now finally her prayers have come true. <laughs> this is not a good thing. No, that's not good at all. Well, you know, uh, if you look at some of the comments to your post here on uh, Beyond the Noise, you can see. Right away, people are just distrustful of CDC, of FDA. You know, no matter what you say in your column, they still don't trust them. And so uh, that's something that has to be fixed. And I don't know how to do that. I don't think it's terribly fixable. I think there's going to be a certain percentage of people who will always feel that way. And I, and I guess for me, the, the I guess the point the flex point for that evolution was vaccines cause autism. So mm. a paper was published late 1990s claiming that, you know, the, the MMR, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine caused autism. And to the credit 
of the public health agency. To the credit of, of academic, academicians and pediatricians, many studies were done costing tens of millions of dollars to answer that question. Are you more likely to get autism if you've gotten that vaccine or not? And that convinced most people. I mean, most yeah. parents of children with autism were convinced by that, but not all. So there's still a solid 10 to 15 percent that still hold on to that notion, even though it's clearly been shown not to be true. And I think that's the group that are the conspiracy theorists. And conspiracy theorists theory now is just part of the mainstream. I mean, you hear, in theory, responsible congressmen using the term deep state all the time. So it's it's that's what you're up against. That in social media makes this a very steep hill to climb. So what are you doing going forward, Paul, if you see another vaccine that doesn't scientifically make sense? Are you going to speak out or is this tending to quiet you down? No, I, I think we just did that in the last <laughs> episode. I think with the, the, the maternal RSV vaccine, there are some questions about that vaccine. And I think although it is now a licensed product, it's now a recommended product, I think it's fair to say some of the questions and concerns that did come up in, 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 in discussions both at the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee and the ACIP um, advisory Committee, the, the mm. Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices to the CDC. I think we talk about transparency, but we're, we, in, in truth, we're a little scared of transparency and, and for understandable reasons, because the minute you really tell all and you show what's, what science is, which is always a process of evolution, and you never know everything, and you are, are learning as you go, that is frightening to people because, especially at the beginning of this pandemic, you know, when the virus was killing 2,000 people a day, 3,000 people a day, you want people to believe you know everything you need to know when you don't. And we didn't. You didn't know about myocarditis uh, as a rare consequence of the mRNA vaccine. You didn't know about uh, severe clotting, including clotting in the brain with the J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which ultimately drove that vaccine off the market. We haven't used that vaccine here since May. You learn as you go. It's always true. And I think we just have to make that clear that, that this is the beauty of science in many ways. It's open-mindedness. It's willingness to change as we learn, as we go. And people just have trouble accepting that. I mean, Dr. Fauci has probably been the biggest target in all this as, as for example, masking recommendations changed or, or other things changed. Um, I think he was a, um, you know, he was a victim of that, that learning as we go problem. It's always hard to combine science and public health, right? They're, they have slightly different objectives. And in a pandemic, it, it exacerbates the whole situation. This is not going to change anything soon, anytime soon, unfortunately, because as you said, it, this country is polarized and it's partly the internet, partly politics and, and many other things as well. And all we can do is, as you have always said, let's look at the data. Let's make sure the data tell us what to do, or at least we follow them. I think that's the key. And tell the truth, it, it, as, at least as you see it. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, as I see it, I may not be right, but I, I you know, because yeah. you have to be true to yourself and, and trust that at least I think a decent section of the American public does appreciate that, appreciate seeing, uh, the, explaining science as it is, which is a process of evolution and knowledge and learning things as you go. You're, but you, you made the, the perfect point. It's a pandemic. And I think especially certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, people are pretty intolerant of any sort of um, flaws in, in the science or cracks mm -hmm. in the science or not knowing everything at the beginning. But to see what we should do is, is be better at emphasizing the fact that there are systems in place that very quickly can detect whether we're right or wrong. And then very quickly, I think, explain to the American public of what we learned and how we learned it. So in a better world, that they would all be part of this process of learning as we go, which would only in theory make uh, science people appreciate science and the process of science more. Well, you can read the original version of Paul's column at Beyond the Noise on Substack. There'll be a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. Cool.